see the text. Also, I don't know. got access to the materials. I think it almost was an audio recording. For audio. Yeah. yeah. So there continues to be uh, more people sending emails and being interested. So, wow. yeah. so we haven't filled our audience yet. Mm -hmm. No, not yet. <laughs> so. Okay. All right. Stop playing around. We'll get to that later. All right. So, um, so do we have any new people here today who want to be added to the Google Drive? What's your uh, uh, thing? K7D, yeah. Well, I don't know. KLK73. KLK73. So uh, today I uploaded um, Tea Time Class 1, which is the one that I was using that has everything filled out. If you want to go reference that or see how I was able to do anything, if you weren't able to jot it down, um, that goes over most basic R things in terms of arrays, um, data frames, classes, assigning things, if for, uh, for loops and if statements, um, also some other things with writing and reading. Um, data. Uh, but today we'll be on tea time class two. Um, so I'm going to, uh, Jack wrote most of this, but I'll go over all of it. Um, so this is going to be mostly plotting. So we're going to look at the basic plotting functions in R um, so that way we can look at our data quickly and visually. And then if we have time, we'll start maybe jumping into ggplot, which is just a really nice graphics package that R has. Um, it's a lot more complicated, uh, but it is actually, the concept is simple and really you can make whatever you want in ggplot. It's very malleable as a uh, thing. So um, just to kind of start, we'll just start off again going through this whole thing. Um, so in this script I have right here, um, uh, we just libraried in data sets and if you don't have, and that's a package, so install.packages is what you want to type in to um, get that one in there. So uh, install.packages, <laughs> and you'd want to put data sets. And if you ran that, I don't think I spelled it right. It's already in. Oh, just, my computer is not very good, so sometimes this happens. So if you already have it in there, it'll ask you if you want to update it. Um, so it kind of gets mad. So if you already have it, don't worry about it. Um, and then you need to library it in to make sure that it's in your session and you're ready to go. Um, one of the da uh, data sets in there is MT cars, which we were looking at yesterday. So MT cars has a ton of different cars um, with their different miles uh, per gallon, cylinders, displacement, horsepower, weight, um, and a couple other things in there as well. So we'll be using that data set to make some generic plots and um, go through that stuff. So uh, yesterday, Jack went through quickly creating a line graph. Um, so one thing you can do is you can attach the data set to your memory and then it will look at all the different columns. They're much easier to grab that way. Um, you can always do it by dollar sign, this is actually something I don't know if I touched on, is that if you have a data frame and you put dollar sign, that means column. Um, so you could say, yes, I want miles per gallon. So if we just view that, there's your entire column right there. So dollar sign lets you get into a column and then access it. 
If you want to see a certain element inside of that, we could say we want to look at the third row of that miles per gallon. And we can look at that and it will give us 22.8. So the dollar sign allows us to get into the column and then we can search around in there um, or do operations in there. Oh, yeah. So another thing that we could do with the data um, that's very useful is using the function head. So if we do head MT cars and run that, it will give us a quick summary of the top of the data set. So typically the top is the most useful because it has all the different uh, columns in there and all the different data that you have. So we can quickly look and see miles per gallon, all these different um, things in here. How big is the data? Kind of similar to like summary in terms of a way to assess the data very quickly. Um, so we can go now and make a quick plot and this will default to a scatter plot. Um, plot is a basic function in R, uh, the basic R graphics, and it is just plotting on the x-axis here, weight, and then on the y, miles per gallon. If I put plot in here and didn't fill it out, well, we'll just ask for help plot. So question mark plot. will tell us the help file for generic plotting um, in R. Uh, so we've got plot x, y is the usage, um, and then three dots means that there's a ton of other options that you could use in there. So uh, moving that is like type, types of lines you want to use. Um, there's a couple different things we could do. Um, I will jump to plotting a line instead of a scatter plot by doing plot weight, miles per gallon, and then I'm going to write in type of line that we want and L. So if we look over here, it says L is for lines. So do that. So now I made some lines. Um, now the way that it's making these particular lines is that it's going from the first value it saw to the next value to the next value. And these were not placed in there in any particular way, so it's going to just make all these lines. Scatter plot is definitely something more useful for us um, in this situation. Um, we could even do some other ones. I think another one is plot, weight, count, let's do type. I think P is one, maybe. Oh, that's point. Okay. O is uh, dots with. Um, the lines through them. So there's a lot of different options, and whenever you question question mark plot, you can look at all the different ones you could possibly do. A lot of different options in there. Um, we can also there's also think main is to create a title, um, sub is to create a subtitle, x lab is your x label, y lab is your y label, and ASP is aspect ratio. Um, there's also some examples down here if you wanted to run those for fun. So um, I believe we could just run that. Can run that. So moving to this, um, Jack showed this uh, really briefly yesterday that we can use a cool thing called LM. LM is a uh, linear model. Um, so it fits a linear model to your data and you're just doing this to show you that, oh, we've got all this data sitting there. Do a quick LM where we want to look at Let's look at miles per gallon as a function of weight um, and create something. We could also add things into this. And this is, we'll get into linear regression more later, but um, say we wanted to do cylinders too. Um, so we could add those two in there. And that would make a model that's based on two variables as a formula um, that will go to miles per gallon. Um, and now we can also do ab line. This isn't going to really work very well because it's not on the same plot. Because um, we originally plotted weight in miles per gallon, and now we have some model that has weight as miles per gallon and cylinders. So it really won't work for this, so we'll get rid of that just for the sake of this actually working. And um, I'm going to do some nice dots, and then make the model. And then make the line. So there's our scatter plot. We fitted some line. We threw the line in there. Um, looks all nice. 
Um, now we want to do some other things. We can add a title to there. So we can do title to create a title. Um, or what we could have done, which was an, is another option, is we could have just said way back in the beginning, let's throw a title in, or let's throw in a title, which in the function is main, and we'll just write the regression. And then we could say x lab equals miles per gallon, and um, y, or this is, um, Oh yeah, no, that is miles per right? I don't remember which one's which. Oh yeah, okay. X lab is weight, and Y lab is miles per gallon. So we could run that, and now we have a better, although it was kind of already there, because it was just the basic thing for the plot function to do, if you don't tell it what the labels are, it's just gonna grab those column names and throw them there. So it originally had weight in lowercase, and MPG in lowercase, uh, when we originally just ran the plot, but we can make it a lot nicer. We can say, um, we can go back and say weight and put it in parentheses over here and say this is in kilograms. So that way, when someone's reading our plot, they know what our units are. So that's how you just edit that in um, as just a simple character addition. Um, so that's uh, a scatter plot, um, also making it lines if you want lines. There's some other type of things that we can also do. All right, so the X lab and the Y lab is the way that you label that Yes. Your so it's the Y label and the X label, and there's also a sub. I've actually never used sub. Um, and we always put quotation marks around them. And each argument is separated by a column as well. So we did that. So I guess the sub subtitle comes at the very bottom. I've never used one, but that's what works there. And also in LM, the MPG tilde WT, that's part of their, that's part of the uh, formula for models. And so it's sort of an odd syntax, right? You're just defining, I want uh, my response MPG to be a function of my predictor WT, and then figure out what it should be. And so you can add more things. But so that's a rather odd looking There's some other nice tricks that happen in there too, but we'll get to that mm -hmm. in great detail when we do linear regression. Mm -hmm. um, all that stuff. Um, all right, so, so the, the, the sub is like uh, the subtitle on the x axis. Is there a subtitle on the y axis? Um, I'm pretty sure you can move things around. Uh, it's a lot of the things in R, especially with plots, are pretty malleable. So you can um, say uh, you could throw legends in there. I don't think I actually put a legend in here. Um, but uh, you can put a legend or an X label and you can move it in different places. There's a way to say position right or position bottom, top, left, and it will put those things around. So I think you can move your titles around. Um, I know you can move things like legends around really easily. Now, ggplot is entirely ma malleable. You can do anything that you possibly ever dreamed of doing in ggplot. Um, our basic graphics are very good for getting stuff up real quick, doing it, making sense out of it, um, but they're not completely uh, malleable like the ggplot is. Do log axes? Um, yes, you can. Um, we could even. Yeah, I don't. I'm not sure what you'd have to put in for it to call it log, but you, usually if you have, um, you can make a model, and if you make, when you're making the model, you can write log of weight, and it would do the transformation, and as you plotted it, it would plot it out in log form. Um, I'm not exactly sure how to force it to go there. I haven't done a log plot myself, but I'm sure that that is an option in there. It might be like plot.log, or some plot.log parentheses. This is what I would always do. Let's do it real quick. 
um, plotting, log, scales, and, um, and probably be something in here from Stack Exchange except for the one thing, or Stack Overflow, plotting, log, scale, and R. And somebody had a problem because they weren't able to do it, and then someone probably answered it right here. Oh, uh, yeah, let's make a log plot. So, I guess I don't have one of the functions. Calgar. Well, I'd probably have to go find where Calgar comes from, whatever that function is. Um, but it probably belongs to some package that you can get from somewhere. Um, but it looks like someone has the solution there um, where they put log equals x is all they needed to put in there. So actually, if we did this again and put there's a log scale. So um, all we had to add in there was log equals x, and now we've got two, three, four, five as it goes down. I wonder if it'd be more interesting if we did it in the other way. Well, no. <laughs> yeah, that has more of a difference. Um, all right, so we can really, I probably should have put way more on just this basic plotting of scatter plots. Um, I may do some more for Tuesday. Um, we'll see. But we'll move into some histograms, which is just another option that you can do in R. So using that same um, data set, empty cars, let's look at miles per gallon. Let's make a histogram of it. Um, so this histogram tells us uh, the frequency in there and all the different cars and how many. So there's six cars between 10 to 15 miles per gallon um, and so on. So you can quickly group uh, your data up into a histogram just using the function hist. Um, see what else. Now we can make it a little bit more interesting. We can change the color. So, uh, and we can also tell how many times it breaks. So, we want to say that our histogram, we want 12 um, breaks in the data for where we're going to make all the histograms. Do that evenly. And then we're going to call the color blue. So, we'd like to see this as a blue thing. And there it is as a blue thing. Um, this reminds me of something else I can also do up here for more fun. So we could also back here say that we wanted all our dots to be red. And we could make all the dots red, or blue, or green, or whatever. Um, we could also say that we want it to be pretty thick. So there's a thing called line width. Will this work? Yes, it will. So line width is how thick do you want your plot to be? This is just playing around with the aesthetics. So how, how bold do you want your line, your dots, or anything to be um, and using uh, LWD? And I said 2, we can say 20, and we can see how ridiculous they'll get. Yeah, there's so many dots in there. Um, so there's some more. Yeah, they're kind of not very even, kind of splotchy dots. I'll make sure, there's not a legend in here. If I forgot to put in a legend, I'll make sure I have a legend on Tuesday. Um, so we can also make dot plots. Jack put this in here. I've never made a dot plot, but here's a dot plot. Um, so, we'll look at this. Um, what this dot plot does is it actually takes all the values in our uh, column that has all the different cars and stuff and then throws them up there and throws on a scale where do they lie. So if you wanted to see your car really quickly and say, oh, I drive a Chrysler Imperial and I'm losing a lot of money on gas, um, you could spot it there compared to everything else very quickly. Um, so this is something that um, Dotplot is able to do. And uh, in this, you want to it says labels. So what is the thing that we want to be labeling in our dot plot? So the labels of the row names empty cars, because um, if we look at empty cars, it's actually not a column. It's, a, it's a, the row names. So if this was a column over here, we could say labels equals the first column. 
Um, but in this case, it's actually the rows. So we said the labels are going to be the row names of our variable empty cards. Row names is actually a function. So if we did like row that names on H, which is H is sitting over here, it should just return to us one, two, three, or maybe not. data frame, it'll give you the row names of one, two, three, four, five, because those were the rows that they were sitting in. Um, so in this case, labels, row names. Uh, let's see, what does CBX do? Is that the yeah, size? Size. Yeah, it's the size uh, aesthetic in basic plotting. So if we change this to seven, we'll see what happens. I think it'll be pretty major. No, it said that we made it way too big. So. Yeah. So there's there's CX. It just changed all this, and now you can't see anything. Um, whereas before, at 0.7, it was a lot easier to read. So CX is actually on the margins. That's what that is. It's on the margins. So CX changes the margins that you have in your figure. Um, again, everything in here is pretty changeable. Um, then we gave it a name. Main equals gas mileage for car models, and uh, X label miles per gallon. Um, now we can do uh, an interesting thing where we're going to ask it, well, you know what, we want to order these in a much interest, more interesting way to visualize the data. So there is a uh, function in R called order. And so what this is going to do is it's going to say, we want to order empty cars, uh, the column miles per gallon, we want to order it in some way. And we are doing that inside, this, this is actually kind of a little bit complicated. So empty cars, mile per gallon row. Mm -hmm. We're going to order that. And now this empty cars, our actual data frame, we're going to reorder it into the rows. So we're going to order by rows of our miles per gallon. And we're going to save that to the variable x. That makes sense. Just say it one more time. Okay. So this function will order. Let's do it one by one. Order empty cars. That's for gallon. So this, what this did was it, it's telling me, and I believe default default is either ascending or descending order. We'd have to look into order to figure out which one it is. I think it's ascending order. Um, so it's, it's saying that the first row in our data frame in the column miles per gallon is the 15th highest miles per gallon value. And this, this one way out here is actually the first one. So what we're going to do is we're going to take all these values because we've now ordered them and we know like what they are relative to all the other values and we are going to rearrange the rows in the rows um, index. So we have the row index, and now it's going to say, OK, the first row is now the 15th row, the second row is now the 16th row, and so on, all the way through. And the reason why it's going to do it to this data frame is because it's inside of empty cars. So empty cars indexing rows and all columns. So it's going to switch all columns with it. And it's going to save that into x. Um, one thing about, uh, oh, I guess we, yeah, right there. So when you have characters in your data, so say you had like um, uh, black, blue, and green, um, the way that models are able to plot those things and understand them is by the class factor. So uh, I talked a little bit about factors before and how they're complicated, so now I'll get into them. Um, so factors allow for categorical value variables, whereas like a character is just a character, and it doesn't the computer doesn't understand how one character differs from another character. So a factor is basically saying that if we have these three blue, black, and green, that if we look at them as factors, black stands for one, blue stands for two, and green stands for three. 
it will just assign it a value, and then it will refer to that value every time it sees it. So what we're doing here is we're saying that looking at the number of cylinders that are in that column of cylinders, we're going to now call that a factor. And it will just identify as two cylinders, four cylinders, and six cylinders as all the same things in those three groups. So we need to do that with factors. Um, and we're going to ask this, uh, which ones, uh, this isn't too important to understand this, but we're just going to ask which ones are four cylinders, and we're going to set them to be red. We're going to ask which ones are six cylinders, set those to be blue. Ask which ones are eight cylinders, and ask a dark green. And then we're going to make this crazy dot chart that looks really cool, and I'll explain it as we after we look at it. So just with a couple lines, we're able to make this type of plot. Um, and so what this has done is it has gone through and said, okay, we know that there are first we're going to order everything. So it ordered them all up all nicely, and then it looked into what are the three different categories that we have. We have eight cylinders, four, four cylinders, and six cylinders. Then we identified those, grouped them up into three places, and then using the order that is already ordered, we now have them going in. So your best car that you could get is, your, is a Toyota Corolla. If you want to get like 35 miles per gallon. Um, I'll jump back and try to explain each part of the dot chart. So in here, um, again, we're going to look at the miles per gallon and that variable X that we've put everything that's now reordered. The labels are the row names, just as we had before. Our margins are 0 0.7. And we're going to say group by the cylinder count. And you can only group if something is a factor. You can't group by anything else. Only factor is the way that you're able to group things up. That's the, that's the nice piece of factors. So we're going to say our groups are the cylinders. And then we're going to give it a uh, main, a title, an X label, and uh, I don't know what G color is. It's, it's something. I think it's something with the, the graphics color. Here is going to be black, and then we're going to say that the color of all of the different groups was decided upon earlier with this piece. So X color is um, we made a new. Oh, actually, yeah, that's it. Sorry. So if we look back at X, um, these have now been reordered. We should. Have so all the cars have now been reordered into ascending order with the highest one down here, our Toyota Corolla. And in X, we actually made, when we were doing this, we made a new column. Can you go back to how you order them like that? Yeah. So in here, yeah. we looked at empty cars mile per gallon. And now we ask, at the current state of where empty cars is, mm -hmm. if I just ran the order, order empty cars, FBG, it goes, OK, the first one is the 15th, the second one is the 16th, the next one, the third one is the 24th. And it now understands that where these need to be placed to be in correct order. And then it replaces them by putting it in the row index of the original data frame. Did you go over the, uh, for the main title, there's a backslash M there? Yeah, for the new line. Oh, that's a new line. Yeah. So backslash M <coughs> is for a new line in your title. I've never actually used it, but. Um, so if you have a very long title and it's going to go off the page, backslash n is going to skip one space down, um, and you can put it right in the middle of your character string. So I guess don't use backslashes. I think it time. might not work if you use single quotes instead of double quotes. It'll, it might just give you, turn out the uh, slash n. Oh, never mind. It's just a different language, I guess. Yeah. Um, 
But if I go back to this X data frame that we had, when we use the dollar sign column, so say, okay, dollar sign column, we now said we're going to make a new column called color. And we're going to assign the color of red to all of the ones which meet the criteria that the cylinder is four. So four cylinders. And we're going to call that red. So if we look over an X, all the ones that are four cylinders over here, tons of fours, they all say red because they now have a new column that says red. Um, and then we did the same thing with six and with eight and assign that in that column. And then we can just call that the color is defined by that column. So for each one that it goes to, it goes, oh, what color should this one be? So when this is generated, for every single car that comes up as it's plotting it, it looks into that column to determine what color it's going to be. Um, so that's kind of nice and dynamic that it looks at all those things and you don't have to set it uh, yourself, like one by one. Right, like how this is? Yes. So, um, you need to have a comma there. So the comma is going to indicate to the code that it's not done with what's going on. So then it goes, okay, we're going to read the next line, and it keeps going, and sees the comma, and then it goes, okay, next line. And then when it finally sees this ending parenthesis, then it goes, okay, we're done. So if I get rid of this one, whoops, if I get rid of that, it's going to give me a time. Plotting has a lot of things in it, so just kind of keep on going over it, and hopefully it kind of sticks. Move on to the next type of plot. And even though this is all base graphics type stuff, so it's a good way to get quick things, but I w it's better to spend time learning ggplot for the figures that you want to make beautiful and perfect. Yeah. You, you could make a beautiful and perfect thing in base graphics, but it takes a lot of work. Yeah. You might want to spend that time learning ggplot. Yeah, ggplot's really nice. So like this looks nice, but ggplot makes it look real nice. So, um, all right, so we'll move on to, uh, we could make a pie chart too. So let's just make some slices. We're just making an array by concatenating um, five different values, 10, 12, 4, 6, and 8. They are concatenated. And um, we'll make labels. For each one of those, we'll call them the US, uh, UK, Australia, Germany, France. Okay. And now we can generate a pie chart. So we're going to call slices as the, as the X variable in here. We're going to call labels, or we're going to set the labels to be um, this array of labels. And notice that both arrays are of the same length, so they will match up real nicely. Um, and then we'll just give it a title of main. So, and there is a pie chart for us. Kind of nice. And um, we can even do a little bit more math. We can say, let's add some percentages into it. So this is just the math to turn them into percentages. I'll just kind of skip through. So you can do sum. Sum is a function in R to sum all of the slices together. And then we'll take each slice, divide it by the sum, multiply it by 100. We're going to round it so it's a nice number. And we'll say that those are all the percentages. And now we're going to take the labels, and we're going to use the function paste. And so paste is going to, fun is going to take us as a character, and it's going to paste right next to it the number, which will now become a character, the percentage. So it's going to take the one labels take the percentage, paste it right up, and now our new label is a name with a percentage on it. So if I looked at labels right now, uh, labels, there they are. And if I run through this and I paste them together, oh, I don't want to. <coughs> now 
they have a 20 next to it. There are 20, 24, 8, 32, 12. So now we've pasted those together. Another kind of basic function there. We can do another paste, and this is paste to zero. So uh, the slight difference in this one is that paste zero is going to make the separation between what we're pasting zero. So it's going to be right next to it. We could have done that earlier with another thing. Um, I'm going to show it in another way. This is how I like to do it. Paste. We're going to have to paste labels. Percentage. Or the percent symbol. And we're going to separate it, SEP equals, one equals, quotations, nothing inside there. By putting nothing inside the quotations right there, we're saying that you're just going to smush them together. No spaces. Or we could put like blah in there and put blah in between. But every single space that it detects in there, it'll put blah. So, all right, so there, there it is again. We'll run this and we will look at labels again. And now we have the percent sign right next to it. And then we run the same thing again. Um, the only thing that we're going to change in here is that we're going to say, you know what, let's do the color of the rainbow. Let's do some other things in there. So rainbow, see if I just throw it in there. Oh, I want something. So six will give me six different lines in here that refer to some number, or to some color. Uh, that's just the palette number um, or character for those things. So rainbow here is saying we want um, rainbow colors and we want as many colors as the length of labels. Now length of labels is going to be five, so we're going to have five different colors out of the rainbow palette that are going to be in our plot. So if we run that, now it's prettier and more vibrant because it looks at the rainbow. So there it is. Oops. It's a rainbow. Yeah? Oh yeah, the code. Just trying to look at this nice chart. to move on. So the next thing we'll cover real quickly is uh, pairs plotting, not pairs plotting, pairs plotting. And so pairs plotting is a nice way to run some early data analysis on the data that you have. So you can quickly look at, oh, I have all these columns and I want to see maybe how they correlate or how they plot against each other. Um, so it's kind of real nice. So remember we have our empty cars data. We're going to run the function pairs. Just that. It's going to be a little crazy. And it's going to pop up with this thing, which has a lot of stuff going on. I think I'm going to make it a little bit simpler so we can see it. One, two, six. So by throwing in one to six in the columns there, I'm saying let's only plot the first six columns and nothing else. Right. So we plot that jump here. So what it has now made really quickly for us, if we're looking at some early data stuff, is um, we now have the column miles per gallon, cylinders, displacement, horsepower, uh, whatever drain is, and weight. And um, with these, each one of these plots corresponds to the other one in the diagonal. So this plot right here has miles per gallon on the x-axis and cylinders on the y. And then over here, miles per gallon on the y-axis and cylinders on the x. And so a lot of these plots that are going to pop up in here are probably not too useful to us and we don't really care too much. Um, but some of them are going to really stick out. So the one thing is we can say, well, hey, this looks like 
there's a pretty nice trend going on with the different types of cylinders that you have. They're over a range, but they're kind of moving in some way. Um, you can look over here and say, oh, miles per gallon seems to have some type of trend with horsepower. Um, or displacement and horsepower also seem to be having some type of line that's worth worthy of looking at a model. Um, and some other ones, looks like a lot of these are actually pretty decent. Um, but some of them, maybe this one right here is just a bunch of baloney that we don't really need to look at because it's just a ton of noise and we're not finding any correlations. So we can quickly find some, um, just looking at all these plots really fast instead of individually going plot this, plot that, plot the next one. Let's just plot them all and look at them all at the same time. Can you put the line to the pressure, for example, and all of them in a row when you're doing experiments? Good. So we'll do that next. You could, but Roger doesn't like in a data science <laughs> point of view, it's much better not to. That's already biased in your thinking. And so it's better just to look at the raw data straight. And these pairwise correlation figures are very fast ways that visually our brains just find relationships quickly. And sometimes if you fit a linear regression line, it might act not actually be what should be there. So you can almost mislead yourself. Yeah, if we go back to. Um, Say this one. I kind of think that the line makes sense going right there. Seems to be where the there's noise happening around here. But if then we go back and we plot, oh, that's because we it's in log now. Okay, hold on. Okay, so right there, and then we do the model and we plot the line. I would think that it's more like that. But because because I tend to notice with my eyes where the noise is, that it looks like it's really just happening there and not like that. Um, so that's kind of the benefit of just looking at it and saying, oh, I, I can understand where the noise is here rather than the computer. Um, but both are still good. Um, so now we'll do it with the lines, but you can get rid of the lines if you want. Um, so I'm going to load in a, pa a package called Mass. Um, Mass, I think, has something to do with Massachusetts because it has a uh, Boston data set inside of it. Um, the Boston data set has a ton of things on crime and uh, demographics and stuff like that. Um, but I think it has some more interesting things in there. We can do a pairs of Boston, one to seven. And so let's see, what does it have inside of it? It's got crime. Some uh, zone, whether or not it's in, this has a lot of categorical values in it. Um, if it's industrious or not, the NOx level, the age of people, some other things just in there. But if we install another package called Psych, install that package as Psych, see if we have it. And we can do another. I actually decided I don't want to use the library of Boston. So. Might take a couple minutes for it to get in there because I guess I didn't have it in there before. I thought I did. Um, and so what this other package, Psych, has a function called pairs.panels in. So pairs.panels is very similar to a pairs plot, but it has way more going on in it. So as we'll see in a bit, um, it's going to show us these particular graphs, but it's going to say that, you know what, these are all redundant on the top, and we don't really care to see redundancy. We're going to do something maybe better in there. Um, so we'll do library and psych. We can do this. Pairs.panel will give us some more information. So it's going to take all those values. It's going to fit a spline to it. Now, actually, in this function, there's a lot of different options that you can say, I don't want a line. I don't want a spline. I don't want to see the ellipses in there. I don't want to see this line. It's You can change all those things in there. But this is kind of mostly what it has to offer. So um, along the diagonal, you'll see all of the different columns that we had. And then also a density distribution all the histograms of where are all the weights sitting, where is all the horsepower sitting, 
And then over here we have our uh, scatter plots again. Um, they threw some lines through there. And then over at the top, we have correlation coefficients. So we have all the correlations here, and we can quickly say that, well, it looks like um, cylinders and displacement is very correlated. Uh-oh, 50 or more warnings. That's never good. So here's the help function for pairs of panels, histograms, and correlations for a data matrix. Really a data frame. Um, better. Um, what? Oh, that's what I mean. It's scale, not scales. So if we do scales, it will make the correlations be bigger if they're more important and smaller if they're not more important. So, um, I don't know if you always want to do this in a scholarly paper, but it's kind of fun to do when you're just looking at it real quick. Say, oh, there's 0.9, that looks pretty good. Um, 0.45, not so good. So those are a pair of plots for doing some early data analysis. Sound good? Oh, it's past 4.15. All right, well, since it's past 4.15, um, I'll stop. The next thing that was on the list here was ggplot2. And ggplot has some really cool things for looking at your stuff. Um, it just looks nicer. You can do um, nicer looking things, all that stuff. So we'll go through in detail how ggplot works and how it does all these fancy, schmancy things on Tuesday. All right, thanks, Luke.